Thank you, Mr. Murphy, and this will be very brief, uh, young people and guests. We're excited. I hope you're excited. I am. Uh, some of you are wonderful. The president arrived, and Mrs. Collier, our school board chairman, Mr. Culver, rec Dr. Culver, rep. rep of Mr. Jenkins engineering drawing. <laughs> and Dr. David Sawyer, Assistant Superintendent of Management Information. <laughs> that. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, would you please remain standing and join the combined choir as we sing our national anthem.
school has developed from concept to reality. And now, Mr. President and members of the audience, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the chairman of the Fairfax County School Board, Mrs. Mary Collier. Mrs. Collier. Fair. Fairfax County loves its schools, and Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology is a monument to excellence. And in that entrepreneurial spirit which sets our economic system apart from and above any other in the world, they put their money where their imaginations were. This high school can boast state-of-the-art laboratories in telecommunications, sponsored by AT&T, life sciences and biotechnology, sponsored by Hazelton Labs, Malloy Labs and FMC Corporation, computer systems, sponsored by Honeywell, Hewlett Packard and Computer Sciences Corporation, material sciences, sponsored by Atlantic Research, and engineering and energy sciences, sponsored by Virginia Power and Light. 200 years later, this remarkable achievement of our citizens. It is the greatest honor of my professional life to have the privilege of introducing to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Chairman Collier, Superintendent Spillane, Principal Murphy, Principal Valreth, and Walter Culver, trustee of the Fairfax County Public Schools Education Foundation. It's great to be here with all of you at Thomas Jefferson High School. I remember telling Tom that <laughs> if he worked hard and applied himself one day, they might even name a school after him. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Actually, I haven't been around quite that long. But things sure have changed, though, since I was in high school. But I bet there's one thing that hasn't changed. When they told you that you'd have to cancel scheduled classes for a special assembly, I'll bet you weren't too disappointed. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I have to say, speaking of schedules and changing things, over in Washington, when you wake up and there's a little bit of snow, a sprinkling of snow and some ice out there, you know that for some reason or other, schedules are going to get changed entirely and things are going to be canceled out just because of that, that weather and that sprinkling of snow. It always makes me think of the young fellow that was telling his girl how much he loved her. He said, I'd climb the highest mountain to be by your side. I'd swim the deepest ocean to see you. I'll be over Thursday night if it doesn't rain. <laughs> well, I hope that maybe some of you Got a chance to see the State of the Union address to the Congress Tuesday night. My message was that the State of the Union is good and getting better all the time. And I am really convinced of that after what I have seen in your laboratories and classrooms here this morning before I came in here. America is the A-team among nations bursting with energy, courage, and determination. We went through some bad times back in the 1970s, times when big government policies threatened to derail our country and our elected leaders seemed to have lost the way. The American people brought us back with pride and patriotism and with the bedrock American values of freedom, faith, and family. They put this country back on track and we're charging full speed ahead. America holds the future in its grasp and we're not letting go because the future belongs to the free. The, 
To paraphrase Tom Jefferson, we hold this truth to be self-evident. There never was a better time to be young, alive, and American. On the way here today, I was thinking of the changes I've seen in my lifetime and how they'll be dwarfed, dwarfed by the advances that you'll see in yours. Believe it or not, I can remember my first ride in an automobile. Most of the time, it had been horse and buggy. Horse was very fuel efficient, but kind of slow. <laughs> if you wanted to supercharge one, you fed him an extra bag of oats. I can remember back when I heard my first sound over radio, and I was just entering high school, and down by the river where a young man with some of the same qualifications that you have, an experimenter, had built himself a little crystal radio set. There were no such things as factory-built radio sets. There was a station in Pittsburgh, the oldest in the nation, KDKA. And there we were out in Illinois, and finally we'd walked all over town, several of us with him, while he fished around in the air with a handheld aerial. And finally, we began to hear music, and it was this station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And yet, you know, it was just about eight or nine years later that that industry progressed to the point that I got a job as a radio sports broadcaster. And there were institutions and programs and people known nationwide because of the tremendous impact and growth of radio and all in those few years. The, since then, the evolution of technology has become ever more rapid, each step of the way making a better life for man on Earth. Medical technology is conquering one by one the diseases that have plagued mankind for centuries. Biotechnology has invented new grains that are a winning weapon in the war against hunger. And as radio was to my youth, so computers and the information revolution will be to yours, opening up a seeming infinity of possibilities in your lives, possibilities your parents never would have even dreamt of. So I was thinking of how far we've come in this journey and the future, and at the same time, my thoughts return to the tragic events of last week, to our Challenger 7 who gave their lives so that we might reach for the stars. For all Americans, young and old, the loss of our astronauts was felt as a personal loss. We mourn their passing, and we'll continue to honor their memories in the way our astronauts would have wished, by pressing on with their heroic example in our minds, and perhaps a new appreciation of the sacrifice, courage, and faith that are the cornerstones of our free nation. The truth is, uncommon valor is often a common virtue in this country of ours. America is the land of the free because she is the home of the brave. These United States are built on heroism and sustained and protected by it. We see it in the bravery of those defending our nation on the frontiers of freedom. The pilot landing high-performance fighter planes on the heaving deck of an aircraft carrier. The soldier on patrol on the Korean border, in Europe, or on a peacekeeping mission in the Middle East. We see heroism every day here at home. The policeman answering a call, not knowing what danger awaits him behind a closed door. The fireman pulling lives from the flames of a raging inferno. The doctors and nurses laboring late into the night under hospital lights the social worker battling drugs in despair. Not all of us are called upon in our daily professions to face danger and hardship, but each of us has the same responsibility as the hero, to live our lives with honor and dedication, to give 100% to the tasks before us, and to know that every day our efforts are building the edifice of freedom and powering the engines of human progress. And don't ever underrate yourself. Someone has said, truly, the hero isn't braver than anyone else. He's just brave five minutes longer. So whatever path you choose in life, whatever you're calling, pursue it with your heart and soul. If you become an artist, disdain cynicism and have the courage to proclaim your faith. If you become an entrepreneur, that's a French word for being in business on your own. Hold on tight to your vision. 
knowing that each setback is really one more step in the road to success. If you become a scientist, find joy in the process of discovery. Whatever path you choose, if it follows the light of hope, it will lead you confidently into the future. You know, Tom Jefferson was a forward-looking fellow, and I'm sure he'd be proud of this school. Assistant Superintendent David Sawyer took me on a fascinating tour of your computer systems laboratory. He tells me you're thinking of building an artificial intelligence lab here. I sometimes thought we could use a little of that in Washington. He also told me about the other labs where many of you will be learning the skills of this new technological era, biotechnology, optics, and telecommunications. Let's take a moment, too, to thank the businesses and private individuals who've worked as partners in education with Thomas Jefferson High School. Many of those businesses involved in building the technology laboratories will be sending their scientists, engineers, and technicians to help teach in the labs, making the students of Thomas Jefferson some of the best trained leaders for the 21st century. A new universe of possibilities is opening up before your generation, and one of the most hopeful is that science may become the ally of peace. Advancing technology, which originally gave us nuclear weapons, may one day make them obsolete. The currents of progress are sweeping us on to safety. The technology to create a high-tech shield against nuclear missiles is advancing far more rapidly than we even dared hope three years ago when we first announced the program called the Strategic Defense Initiative. I promise you I'll do everything within my power to move forward with research and testing of a high-tech, non-nuclear defense system so that the world you raise your children in will be safe and secure and free from fear. Let's, let's use the wonders of technology not to make war, but to protect the peace. It's no accident that America is blazing the trail of progress through the 20th century and leading the race to the future. We live in a country that encourages enterprise and rewards initiative, a country where everyone is free to contribute and all can benefit from the success of others. Our society is inventive because we're free and prosperous because each individual is secure to gather and keep the fruits of his labor. If we're ever mindful of our enduring principles, the natural rights to life, liberty, and property spoken of in your Virginia Bill of Rights, then America will always be the shining star among nations leading the world on to a better tomorrow. In my State of the Union address, I mentioned another coming miracle of modern technology, a new hypersonic aerospace plane. I brought a model of that aerospace plane with me. <laughs> this, this is truly the shape of things to come. I don't suppose that you could all see that very well, so I'll try to describe it for you. It looks a lot like the pictures of rocket ships that my seven-year-old grandson draws. For those more advanced in years, it'll remind you of something out of a Buck Rogers, and you might say it resembles a Concorde that's been straightened out and had its wings clipped. But it will make the Concorde seem slow. Taking off from a standing runway, it will cruise in the atmosphere at speeds of up to 25 times the speed of sound or fly into low Earth orbit. The aerospace plane will be able to fly anywhere on the Earth in three hours or commute up to the space station that we will soon be building. And we should be conducting the preliminary test flights about the time the freshmen here graduate from college toward the middle of the next decade. I'm going to give this model 
the first model of the aerospace plane that we've made public to Thomas Jefferson High School as a symbol of the future that you, the students of this school, to ask your teacher, Judith Garcia, one of the 10 Teacher in Space finalists, to come up and accept it for you. Now, I hope that she accepts it in the name of her friends, the Challenger 7, as a promise that their vision lives on, and that as long as the men and women of dedication, hope, courage, and faith in this country, as long as they're there, America will continue to take giant strides into the future. So congratulations. over here for the cameras. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to take just a moment here, if I may, to commend you for your far-sighted leadership as demonstrated by your continued support of the space program. And also, I would like to express my appreciation for your concern that you share with teachers all over America to provide the finest education possible for our young people. It is a great honor for me to accept this model of the aerospace plane on behalf of Thomas Jefferson High School and School for Science and Technology. This model symbolizes the new and exciting challenges of the future which impact heavily on our present. Never before has science and technology evolved at such a pace, sometimes revealing answers to long-standing questions, but more often presenting us with ever greater mysteries to be solved and new worlds to be explored. For example, on January 24, 1986, spacecraft Voyager passed by the planet Uranus, and in less than one half a day, we had learned more than astronomers that had learned over a period of 200 years before. The realm of human knowledge is expanding so rapidly that often our textbooks become obsolete before they leave the press. Never before in human history has the challenge to educators and students been greater or more critical. We as a nation are facing a serious dilemma for although science and technology have progressed rapidly, the youth of our nation has slipped behind the young of other nations in preparing themselves in the areas of math and science. We are now making conscientious efforts to remedy this very serious situation. But as we do so, we must maintain a clear perspective of ourselves. We should encourage the study of science and math without neglecting the humanities. Our future, thank you. Our future in space and on the planet Earth will require ever greater international understanding and cooperation. Already other nations, such as Germany and Japan, are working with NASA as partners on the space station. On Earth, our aerospace plane will enable us to cross continents and oceans in just a couple of hours, bringing faraway countries ever closer to us. Indeed, teachers are being challenged as never before as our nation entrusts our most precious resource, our children, to our tutelage. But the burden of education does not rest solely on the teacher. Krista McAuliffe often stated with great pride, 
I touch the future. I teach. I would like to leave the students here with this thought. As you learn, you build the future. Education is a partnership requiring responsibility, cooperation, and diligence from both the instructor and the student. And we must certainly not neglect the vital role parents play in the learning process as well. The frontier of space beckons irresistibly to us to explore its planets and moons, to search for life in other solar systems, and to marvel as the secrets of the universe are revealed to us. The courage and the dedication of the Challenger crew of seven will serve to inspire and guide us as we continue their journey to the stars. Thank you. So kind as to consent to answer a few questions from the floor at this time. Thank you. I know there is only a few minutes here, but uh, how do we handle this? Do I just uh, you sing out with a question, or we I have we have some pres questions. some questions for uh, you over here, Mr. President. Oh. They've been randomly selected from both student bodies. And what we'd like to do is just alternate the microphones as the students ask the questions directly to you. And we'll start over at microphone one. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Mike Gould. What effect will the space shuttle tragedy have on NASA's funding? I don't think that it's going to have any effect with regard to, for example, withdrawing of funds or not, and certainly I will oppose and fight any effort to do that. I think you might all be interested to know that on the day of the tragedy, I phoned the families, uh, of all of them that were present on there, and without exception, all of those grief-stricken people that I talked to said to me, you must continue the program. This is the way they would have wanted it, and we are going to. It'll be delayed for a while because of the investigation to make sure we don't have the same thing happen again as we try to find out the cause of the accident. But no, we're going to, I'm going to continue to fight for funding our space program and going forward with the space station. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Noon. From your boyhood on into manhood, did you ever have dreams or ambitions of becoming President of the United States? Or was your decision to go into politics a response to world affairs? I have to tell you that no, I never thought about uh, politics or anything. And if in those years when I went from radio sports announcing to Hollywood and to motion pictures, I was very happy in my work. And if anyone had ever suggested to me that I would do this, I would have bet the house and farm, I wouldn't. And, uh, but I did always believe that you had to pay your way. And I've been blessed in a number of ways, and so in Hollywood, if you don't sing or dance, you wind up as an after-dinner speaker. <laughs> and uh, so I did that, and, and I, uh, I always tried to campaign for candidates and causes that I believed in. And, I made a speech on behalf of a presidential candidate that was broadcast nationwide in 1964. And the next thing I knew, I was being assailed by people to run for governor of California. And I thought they were wrong, and I told them over and over again, I'll campaign for someone else. And uh, they kept insisting that I was the only one that could win for our party in that election. And finally, I began to think, well, if they're right and I'm wrong, will I ever be able to sleep again if I don't do it. So uh, Nancy and I spent some sleepless nights and finally uh, I said, all right. And you know, looking back, I think that I said all right, thinking all he had to do was win the election and then that'd be all over and I'd go back to doing what I was doing. <laughs> Found out I got the job. But I must say, after several months of that, we both looked at each other and said that this was the most exciting thing we'd ever done in our lives to not just be making an after-dinner speech about it, but to be dealing with the problems themselves. And uh, so I'm most grateful that I, my course changed. Okay, thank you.
Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Don Lee. The Constitution calls for the separation of church and state. In your State of the Union address, you propose making prayer in schools legal. With so many different cultures and religions in our nation's public schools, how can you make prayer in schools legal? All right. Let me just say, and let me give you just an example that I happened to mention the other day. On that tragedy that happened last week and that I mentioned, all over this country, in city halls, in state houses, in the offices of the nation's capital here, people stopped and prayed for the seven who had lost their lives. And yet, you, the young people in schools, were denied that privilege to do that in your own schools. I have never asked for a doctrinaire prayer or a school to dictate a prayer or how anyone would worship. I have simply said that I believe that students should have the right and privilege to voluntarily pray within school if they want to. And that's up to them. And no one that doesn't care to or whose religion is different, they can pursue their, their own courses. But you should, I don't think there should be any place in this nation where anyone is denied the right to appeal to whatever God they worship. Thank you. And Mr. President, we're running a little behind. We have time for one last question, sir. All right. I'm sorry. I should have not talked so long. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Kazala Raza. Is there any chance of sending a civilian up in space again? If so, will it be a teacher to fulfill the dream of Krista McAuliffe? Yes, I don't believe that this tragedy in any way should affect the policy that we had, that space, uh, if it is the last frontier, and it should not just be left to individuals, scientists, or career people who are uh, going up there simply to explore in space, there are so many experiments that have given already so much to us. For example, we know in one disease, diabetes, and so far incurable, we have reason to believe from experiments done already in the shuttle program by scientists that have gone up uh, with the astronauts that it is possible if there is a space station to manufacture a medicine that will cure diabetes. Already, however, from the things we've learned there, we are able to monitor heart patients who are going about their daily work. And yet, with a piece of equipment perfected there, their doctor can be seeing at what time of the day this individual showed stress that could be affecting his heart condition. And then could say to the patient on the next call, all right, what were you doing at two o'clock in the afternoon, and thus determine what are the things in the person's lifestyle that are causing the stress that endangers the heart. Um, we've even gone so far as to develop a fabric in experiments up in space that is going to cut hours and hours every day off the time that fishermen have to stay out there, commercial fishermen with their nets. It is an improved fishing net, believe it or not. So we even also have another implant that we can make uh, for a, a patient that requires, uh, well, like insulin shots. And this will be computerized, implanted, and will automatically inject in the necessary glands the medicine that is needed without having to go into an office and have shots given and so forth. So, no, the space belongs to all of us and to the people, and the people can benefit. And you bet teachers are still on the list okay. to go up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for your time. We realize you are running a little late. You have a State Department luncheon to attend. We have just uh, two further presentations for you, sir. All right. Well, Mr. President, you've honored us here today, and we thank you for coming to visit with us. On behalf of our students and our faculty, we have a gift to you, and Mr. Murphy and I would like to present that to you. And I'd like to read this to the audience so you'll know what we're giving the President. And it's a framed, inscribed 
quote from one of his old friends, it's Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> and it says, I have long entertained the hope that this, our native state, would make an establishment where every branch of science deemed useful of this day should be taught in its highest degree. Presented to Ronald W. Reagan on the occasion of his visit to the Thomas Jefferson High School and the Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, February 7, 1986. May I just say a goodbye, and I know I'm late and I'm going to have to run, but I just want to tell you what this morning has meant to me in meeting all of you and seeing what you're accomplishing here. Uh, I am so much more optimistic about the 21st century than I was when I came here this morning, and I was pretty optimistic then. And uh, you have done that, and uh, you've convinced me uh, I'm going to stick around for a good part of that century. Thank you. Mr. President, we have one final gift from you to you from our students.